The <clears throat> following interview was conducted with Zaran, Zaran Baha, Associate Head, Department of Building Construction Management, College of Technology for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Wednesday, May 13, 2009 uh, at Stewart Center. Also sitting in is Stephanie Schmitz from the uh, Archives and Special Collections. Welcome. You can tell us a little bit about where you were born and your parents in early years. Thank you. This is part two. I was born in a village called Yusuf Khil in Wardak province, uh, about 100 family village. And my father was, I think, uh, one of a couple people who could read and write in that village when I was uh, born. And uh, and then when I uh, become school a child, uh, I went to elementary school, uh, which we, we, our village was the furthest location from the school, so we had to walk like most probably for more than an hour to reach school and uh, so the six year of uh, elementary school was kind of uh, difficult because a lot of people from my village will not go to school so sometime I will be going alone the whole you know walk of more than one hour in uh, fields and you know alone and uh, in that environment you know it was kind of not very uh, fun uh, but uh, the school, I enjoyed it because um, from first grade to sixth grade, I stood number one in my class. And number one in that class also, you're automatically called the captain of the class. The captain means that if the teacher is not there, you're responsible for the school, for the class. You have you know, if somebody wants to go out, to go to the bathroom or something, you have to give permission. And uh, you have to keep them quiet. You have to be, so you are responsible for disciplining the class. Since I was relatively small than a lot of students in my class, so it was kind of a challenge how to tame these wild guys. There were some people who were most probably as old as 15 or 16 year old in first grade, in first grade, because they they were there, but they never came to school a class, so they failed and failed and failed for five, six, seven years. Still, they were in that class. Uh, so there were some people with almost having beard, you know, in first grade. So to tame them and bring them under discipline was a challenge for me. The only uh, authority I have was uh, since I was a relatively smart student in the class, so the teacher has appointed me as uh, as the captain. So that was the only reason. So after finishing sixth grade, let me ask you this: How large was the school? How many students did you have? All of your classes in the <coughs> same classroom? No, I mean uh, the the first grade class enrollment was I remember eighty one students. But I would say the regular attendance could be around 30 to 40. So, but I remember even the enrollment was 81 students in the first grade. But attendance normally was like uh, between 30 to 40. So the rest of them did not show up. Okay. So it was, uh, the, the community and the environment of the school was such that very, very few people will be willing to let their children go to school. So each child going to school was practically like drafted to the army <laughs> you had to serve. Uh, so the, the procedure was that the headmaster with another person or two, you know, teacher will come at the beginning, at the end of winter with a list of Somehow he got a list of all the children of school age, sometime maybe anything between five years to 15 years. List of all the children in the village, and they say, well, he got, these are the students that they are uh, of school age. I want to take them all to school. And the, the people will then uh, make a bargaining and uh, 
what do you call, um, accommodate them. And they say, no, we don't have children of the school age, so you, you have to forgive us. We don't have children of school age, forgive us this year or sometime. So finally, they will uh, make a negotiator, you know, like two or three children will be drafted, the rest of them will be released. So I was one of them that my uncle and my father decided that I could go to school and, uh, and uh, I went to school and uh, maybe, maybe for that year saved the rest of the village from drafting. So that's how the, the procedure of uh, school said. It was not, people thought if you go to school you're uh, practically wasted for two reasons. One was religious, they told the people who go to school will become anti-religion. That was one thing. And the second was that uh, while you're a child, you can help in the farm, taking care of the animal and stuff like that. But if you go to school, then you're not useful to the family. So those two factors were that, uh, I think, uh, reason for people to stay away from school, which was unfortunate. Mm -hmm. Were there, the school, was it boys and girls or just boys? No, only boys. Only we boys. never had a girl at school. Okay. Okay. Only when I was uh, coming for my PhDs, I tried to go to the neighboring village, see if we can start a girl's school. Uh, some of the people, you know, they, they nodded their head, okay, I think it's not a bad idea. And... Uh, and the next day when I went for some accidental reason, I went to the village. Uh, I felt the, the sign that people are not ready. So even the director of education of the province went hopefully to open a girls' school, but nobody showed up, so mm -hmm. it was, they were not ready for it. So it okay. took a long time. Okay. I think the first <coughs> girls' school in our village started uh, strange and Taliban time. Taliban who were against the girls school. In their time, my brother who was teaching in Vienna Boys Choir, he was counselor at Vienna's Boys Choir, so he went one summer, started a girls school in our village. This was the, the time the Taliban who were control uh, in Afghanistan, who were in control of in Afghanistan. So that was the first time. Still, we had it like, uh, you know, up to fourth or sixth grade, I think, but now we don't have again a girls' school in the village. Okay. Because again, the Taliban are in control of that area, so they will not let go to school. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, now we'll pick up on where we left off and we'll talk about when you came to Purdue in Department of Building Construction Management. Okay. And uh, I'll leave it up to you, your appointment and research and the site and the curriculum, and then now your associate head. Yeah. Well, uh, <coughs> I came in 1982 uh, before I arrived to the United States. Uh, I wrote to some of my friends, including the Dean of College of Technology, who was my advisor financial advisor when I went to Purdue. And I got my master from Purdue. So I wrote them that uh, I would be looking for a job coming to United States. So they offered me a position of visiting professor in the Department of Building Construction Management. So I, when I came in 1982, I mean, uh, I, I went to stay with my sponsor, who was a good friend of mine, Walter Pilkey in the University of Virginia, Charlottesville. And then uh, visited Purdue, and uh, Purdue offered me the position of uh, visiting professor for one year, this was 1982, mm -hmm. in the Department of Building Construction Management, at that time called uh, Building Construction and, and contracting. contracting, right, yeah. okay. And then uh, after one year, the department had asked me if I could stay for another year as a visiting professor. I said, okay, I could stay. And then after the second year, they asked me, how about if you stay with us, teenager, track, position? I 
it's okay. I mean, they, they went through the process. They went to uh, the president office that the job should not be announced. They should be given to me because they say we had announced this position before. We didn't find anybody with qualification you have. So it will be waste of our resources to announce it again. So, so I was offered the position. As, uh, I was accepted as an associate, you know, associate professor position. In 1988, I applied to, uh, for tenureship. Uh, they said, well, you have fulfilled all the requirement, but we cannot give it to you this year. You have to wait for another year. You don't have to do anything. So in 89, I become, uh, you know, so I become, actually, 88, 89, I become uh, a tenure, or 88, I become tenure, I think, and then uh, in 90, I become full professor. Then I apply for full professor, in, so in 90. Uh, 1990, 90, I become full professor. And then there was a... What pro about your family? Did they now come with you? Okay. Oh. My family, when I came in 82, my wife and two children came in 83. So they were smuggled out of the country to Pakistan, and from Pakistan I brought them here. So they came in uh, March of 83. So it was, uh, but one of my sons stayed there. You have three children? Yeah, okay. I have three children. So my uh, my youngest son and my uh, daughter, who's the youngest of the three, came with my wife. But my older son, who was at the university, he stayed here. Uh, one of the reasons he stayed was uh, because my family, my sister and everybody else didn't want him to go, to leave. <laughs> They want to keep him as a symbol of the family. <laughs> and also he was going to school there, so, so he went there, he came in 86. Okay. So from 82 when I left to 86, so it about took four years for the whole family to get together. Mm -hmm. Did he graduate from Kabul over there? Yeah, he graduated from Kabul University and uh, actually from medical school. Uh, when he came here, in medical school there? Yeah. In Kabul? Okay. Yeah. Been, when he had two alternatives. One is to prepare for a uh, special exam for foreign student for medical, and then uh, be accepted to the residency. Uh, but our friend, who was the head of the IU Medical, uh, you know, internal medicine, Joe Memlan, he advised him that if you want to be a physician here, it's better to start from scratch than uh, going through that medical you know, examination process. Uh, and uh, that's, he took his advice and took few courses in Purdue and took uh, MCAT, uh, was accepted to IU Medical School, and my daughter at the same time so they were both classmates. <laughs> so they studied together. They stay. We were lucky. One was accepted to Fort Wayne campus, and the other one Terre Haute. We requested if they could transfer to Purdue, because Purdue has two year of medical school. You know that. Yeah, it is in the basement of uh, Lynn Hall. Lynn Hall. Right. So they they are high tech them. No, so. Really. Uh, so they, they, they went to a two-year medical school here and the other two to Indianapolis. And they graduated at the same time and so forth the physician. Where did they practice here? My daughter is here. She was working in the American Health Network. There is a group of seven or so doctors. They built a new building uh, in Courtney Lane and Crazy Lane intersection in a building uh, so that's where their offices and uh, my son is uh, practicing in Peoria, Illinois and my other son is uh, in construction uh, management he graduated from construction engineering management 
here at Purdue. Purdue. Uh -huh. From Purdue, and now he's working. Uh, he's uh, assistant project manager at a big power plant project in uh, Missouri, living in Kansas City. So they're all uh, working. Yes. Right. Well, that's very kind. Um, then in the department, they have a lot of the degrees can range. Uh, they've expanded a little bit on that. You've got some specializations. One is that demolition and reconstruction, so they yeah. made some changes. Our department has been uh, one of the good departments throughout the country and one of the best, I would say. And uh, one of the things we started to introduce some um, specialization, we were, I think, the first one to introduce mechanical option in construction and then electrical option in construction and then started uh, demolition and started restoration, healthcare and uh, residential. So these are specialization we can do in other ways. We have quite a few of them. Uh, so and it has been very good and a lot of people the industry supporting them because they never had. I think in most of these area, our department was the first. Mm -hmm. And we had student chapters or so initiated, so it has been uh, relatively good. And our graduate program, as you uh, may know, the uh, graduate program was only in the industrial engineering technology program for a long time because that was sometime part of School of Education was transferred to to College of Technology, uh, but uh, recently, you know, in the last I would say ten years, the College of Technology has initiated to start graduate program, and uh, our department has started two program. One is resident or residence, and the other one is for distance learning. So we have very successful distance learning program where the student do come, you know, one week a semester and then, uh, you know, get the basic thing and then the rest of them is to distance learning, uh, you know, teaching. So we have a relatively good program and uh, I think it's been very successful. Good. That's right. Were there any change in your responsibilities being the associate head? Do you have a specific, uh, do you handle the graduate program or? I, I am not assigned to do any special thing, but uh, you know, normally with the department is not uh, there. I'm responsible sure. to okay. take care of the routine things, you know, signing papers and stuff like that. Or when he assigned me anything that uh, I should, any sure. project, so right. I would be doing. Okay. While yeah. I was at Purdue University, I went also, I don't know if I mentioned, to Malaysia for five years. I was. That was my next question. Talk, mm -hmm. how, talk about that project. Okay, there was a there was a, an institution called Midwest University Consortium for International Activity, right. UCA. Right. We are the headquarters of the Ohio State University in Columbus. So they got a project with Malaysia about twenty million dollar project to train uh, staff for polytechnics because Malaysia was expanding rapidly in order to industrially expand, they need uh, technical manpower. For, they, for those technical manpower, they had to create polytechnics, which is junior high school, a uh, junior uh, college, right. two-year college. Like a community college, a two-year. Yeah, right. two-year. And for that, the bank, the interna I mean, the World Bank actually gave loan for that expansion, and then they said, well, okay, you are expanding the school, how about the staff for that school, you know, right. like, you know, the faculty. For that reason, they develop, uh, fac uh, you know, polytechnic staff training program. And we got the contract, Museo got the contract, as, uh, and Purdue was the leading institution. This was, Museo was made of big 10 institution you okay. know, for this project. And we were the leading and managing institution, and. Uh, the Purdue University asked me if I could, uh, you know, head their program in uh, Malaysia. So I was appointed as a, a resident program coordinator. And I went in 95 uh, and finished it by 2000, so it was five years. 
program exactly. Did you live over there the whole time? Yeah, the whole time. Your family? I went for two years. Then there was extended for another two, and then finally they asked me, well, to finish the last year. So it was five-year projects. So I stayed there for five years. We had about 100 consultant work on the project. Uh, some of these were short-term consultant, could come for a few weeks or a month to work on specific curriculum. And other work were like six months, one semester, or one year, or two years. Maybe some of them stay even two and a half years, you know. So, but I stayed there uh, the whole time. I had uh, five staff, and the, the, uh, let's say I had administrative officer, I had uh, financial officer, I had driver, and I had secretary. So I had uh, four uh, staff in the office, uh, say, which I hired locally, and uh, we were taking care of. So I was a liaison between the institute in Malaysia, uh, which at that time they call it uh, ITO, Institute of Technology, Tonus and on, and, uh, and the faculty, so to facilitate, you know, so they'd be effective and uh, productive, sure. you know, and work with the curriculum, uh, and uh, facilitated work, and provided residence for these people, and facilitated their living condition, and so so I had a quite range of uh, activity to cover. Uh, Did any Purdue people come over? Yeah, from your, from your I think one uh, person came from uh, uh, MAT, Mechanical Engineering Technology, and one person came from Forestry, but the Forestry guy was for a short period of time. There were some people who came from, uh, you know, regional campuses, Portland and uh, IUPOI and uh, you know, North Central, so a lot of people came from, uh, mm -hmm. you know, what you call the regional campuses rather than sure. here. Right. <coughs> so it was a very successful program. The program was designed that after five years, they will close the project. But I think we did a good job on it, uh, and uh, instead of closing the project, they converted to independent university. So now it's independent university. Okay. There are, I think five or six thousand students there. So that's Did any of the students come over to Purdue that were at that project? That yes, some of them did not come to Purdue, but I know some of the people came, and we still have uh, contact with some of them. And some of them still need my recommend, you know, asking for recommendation. And they get a good graduate school. Quite a few of them went to UK. So. Very we good. still uh, in on contact. Uh, we hosted last year the chancellor of that institute with a team of uh, uh, department heads and also some people from the Ministry of Education of Malaysia to host them, to show them uh, the different uh, uh, system of vocational and technical education program in the country. So they came here. They, I arranged the program for them. They visited several universities, including Purdue. So it was very successful. Very good. And so still we are in contact and uh, do help. That's very nice. Yeah. Now the next trip that I want to ask you about is your fact-finding trip to Kabul. Uh, Afghanistan. Purdue. Right. Af or to, yeah, Afghanistan. <coughs> okay. Well, some people. In uh, 202, uh, Kevin McNamara from uh, Ag Economic Professor and uh, Dennis Hingi, who was Department Head uh, of Industrial Engineering, and I took a trip to Afghanistan to as a fact-finding trip to see what uh, could be done and what uh, could we do there. And uh, when we went there, it was really this is the first time shocking, been ba been back shocking. And Shocking How long uh, had it been phenomena since? after 20 years. So uh, I left Afghanistan in 82 and then went in 2002. So exactly 20 years. It was a really sad situation uh, because, uh, you know, when I served as the Dean of Engineering at Kabul University and uh, the building I went to, 
was built by German company Hochti, very modern in the, you know, uh, and very, very nice and, you know, everything was, you know, just similar to any institution in this country. This time when I went to two, two, in the whole, <coughs> big hall, I would say 100 feet hall, was 100 feet or maybe more. There was a bulb in the middle of the hall, maybe uh, 100 watt. That was the only light for the whole hall. So practically you could not see your feet when you were walking. And the labs were in such a situation that there was nothing left, everything that could be carried, that could be taken out of the, you know, the, <coughs> the lab or the, uh, were taken out. There were some heavy machines for testing concrete cylinder, uh, extremely heavy, you can, most people you will carry. If you, you have to take an apart in order to carry it somewhere. So those were broken. I mean, the, the glasses were broken and they were broken. And the, the worst thing, I mean, the extreme example I can give you was the whole university was a ransacked to the point that normally in Afghanistan the, 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 the electric wire or below plaster, first they put the plaster on the brick and then than the plaster, so you don't see any wire. So people, in order to, to, to take the electric wire, so they took it out, so the, whole, the whole area, so they were taken out. There's just the wire, electric wire, were taken out, and so they were taken, even the, within the plaster, they were taken out and were uh, sold for uh, scrap. So that is the extreme. There was nothing left in the whole uh, in the whole university, including library, labs, <coughs> and classroom, chair, tables, anything that you can imagine. They were able were to. They, they were not holding classes there, were they? Or were they? Were well, at that time they were holding classes, oh. but uh, you know, but in were in, in those rooms without electricity. Practically without electricity, without chalk work, practically <laughs> very primitive uh, situation. There were classes. I mean, there were some students going still to classes, but the situation was very, very sad. So it was uh, it was shocking. Every wall you see on campus had holes of bullets. That was you could not recognize. I mean, you, you just just like, you know, the whole thing, like, you, you were thinking maybe they are using like target, for co target purposes. You know, the, the whole wall was full of holes. Mm. So it was, uh, it was very sad, very sad situation. Have you, have you made, uh, has there been some changes? Have you been back since then or? Yeah, I've been there uh, four times. I've been to two or three, Two, 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 three, two, four, and two, six. There are changes has happened. Uh, it's relatively slow, but has happened. It's not yet to the level that was at the time when uh, we we were taking care of the university. But uh, changes happen. Right. You know. And classes kept continuing. Uh, on. Yeah, the classes. Uh, you know, the number has grown drastically. Right. So there is a positive changes, but slow. Growth is on the way then, right? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, you served on a couple department heads. I guess Dewey Moss, was he the head when you came, or your department head? Who was your department head when you came to Purdue? To the okay, Don Ellison was oh, department okay. head. Uh, okay. And then uh, after that, Steve Schutte right. okay. became department head. Uh, then Robert Cox, uh, when he came, he he asked me that since he's relatively new and I'm one of the old timer, I wonder if I can help, uh, you know, whenever there's a need for help. Uh, 
that work as an associate department has no problem, you know, I'd be happy to do it. And that's, uh, I've been helping them since then. Good. Now let's talk about the 40th anniversary and they, that Dewey Moss Future Building Construction, the technology fund that came from that. You had an anniversary. The yeah, I mean, uh, the anniversary, you know, is College of Technology in the 60s <clears throat> in the whole country there was a feeling that the engineers are too scientific. They are not job ready when they go to the field. I mean, they, they, they are, uh, you know, they are too much science, uh, scientific base rather than applied. So at that time, the trend came that let's start another program called Under Technology, under different name, but technology will be the good common name. So a lot of universities started technology programs throughout the country. But there was a tough competition with engineering and technology. They said, well, well, what are you doing? I mean, you know, that's, we are doing it right. I mean, you know, there is no need for technology. What we, do, we want to train technicians. Technician, you know, should be in a community college, not at the university. So there was a lot of uh, rivalry and also, you know, no tolerance and not understanding, you know, that technology and the engineering could stay in the same campus and uh, work together and uh, help the industry and country as a whole. So a lot of these programs did not succeed because of this rivalry within the university and also technology was considered to be, you know, a little technician job and that does not depend on the university. It is not the place is not in the university, it should be community college. Not but uh, engineering and uh, technology in Purdue apparently you know, work together, and uh, they are both very successful. Mm -hmm. So the College of Technology, I think, uh, at Purdue University has been example, like a role model for a lot of, a lot of other universities. We have a uh, very successful program, and, uh, and uh, I remember a few years back, I don't know, maybe four or five years back, at Purdue University, the highest paid graduate in the whole university were, uh, you know, four-year program were uh, our computer technology student. Their average pay was like $53,000 at that time. So they were the highest paid. So that means, you know, they were successful. So the industry needs them and uh, we had in a lot of department we had, the last year we had 100% employment. So, uh, and also, doing good and in the different bits of course uh, engineering and technology was that uh, we are not you know high on math and physics you know science subject we do not need that mm -hmm. higher level and uh, student who are more practically oriented uh, attitude you know they want to do something with their hand and do something yeah, apply so they come here. Like for example, in building construction management, a lot of our students, a good number, would come from uh, the background that the family had construction company. And uh, so here they come and uh, you know, learn you know, professionally rather than being coming through trades. So, you know, and a lot of people wanted to start in construction, for example, their own company in the future. So the 40th anniversary was just uh, an accomplishment that we celebrated and, uh, you know, it's a milestone what uh, the College of Technology has accomplished. And it, uh, they had a brochure, you know, published what they had done. And so it was just uh, a milestone right, yeah. in the life of the institute. Right. Let me great. ask you this about diversity. Do you have in, in the department other many females and underrepresented people? Yeah, I think change? we, in general, we are still working on that one to improve, but in our department, for example, we have female faculty member, and also we have uh, Afro-American, African-American uh, faculty member. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, we would like to keep that one uh, as much as possible, 
you know, when we hired Neva, we were looking for sure. those avenues, see if we can bring some people in that right. uh, gender and race uh, right. diversity. In the College of Technology as a whole, we have quite a good number of mm -hmm. female right. uh, uh, teachers, so right. that's a good sign. But still it's not enough, I think we're still working. Still working on it, right. Yeah. Do some of them, your students, do they come back and do uh, get graduate degrees in there? Have someone doing that? Normally our recommendation to the student is that they should not start after finishing bachelor degree directly to master degree. Our recommendation is that they should get some experience at work. Because when they get experience at work, then they know exactly what they want. They are more mature and they are looking for specifically for an area that they want to improve on and do the future goal of their life, you know, what they want to do construction. So they are goal oriented, not just I'm here to finish my degree and I uh, don't know what they are doing. Uh, so very seldom we will accept, there is a case as you know, we will accept you know, and by a, a, you know, individual, but uh, normally we recommend that students right. do practical work before they right. get uh, yeah. their master's degree. And the distance learning, of course, they are all working full time and uh, they get their degree through a master's, right. I mean distance learning. Right. Um, what, do you have any hobbies or special interests? Anything, hobbies that you like to share with the researchers? Anything special comes to mind? Well, uh, Stephanie is into gardening. <laughs> garden, yeah. oh boy, we have good garden. <laughs> uh, I have a joke for you for gardening. Our king in Afghanistan like very much flower. Everywhere he developed, you know, castle and a lot of flower and uh, gardens and. Uh, it was normally available to the public, so a lot of people went during the summer to enjoy and have picnic there and stuff like that. So we had a minister of education, his name was Dr. Anas, uh, and uh, he was not married and uh, was living alone and uh, he liked to eat. And, uh, so. So he took Dr. Anas one day, invited him to show him his uh, garden and uh, show him all the flowers and everything. And finally told him, what's your favorite flower? I mean, wh what is the best flower you like? He told him, cauliflower. <laughs> <laughs> so he can eat it. <laughs> so I told my neighbor the other day, my neighbor said, yeah, apparently you have a good, uh, Gordon, I say, yeah, a cauliflower. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. we we normally grow something we can eat. Yeah. We have flowers too, but sure. normally we stress it, something to use it. <laughs> because if you plant uh, okra, believe me, they have so beautiful flowers. They do not last, but they're beautiful. Yeah. But we like okra. We usually grow spinach early spring and then when we harvest the spinach, then we grow tomatoes and then feel and uh, other things, cucumbers. Uh, we also one thing that's special in our garden is leek. Uh, we bring, Afghanistan is a special leek. I mean, it's very, very tasty and very spicy taste. Yeah. Uh, so we bring seed from Afghanistan, and then it it is like like green onion, except the the leaves are a little bit thinner. Not onion is thicker, you know. They are thinner. It doesn't have like inside anything, so it's similar. But the taste is much better. We like that. Okay. So we grow uh, the leek. Do so you have an um, outstanding event that you'd like to share with us? Something that comes to mind doesn't have anything in your life that comes to mind. Well, uh, my hobby really is uh, to promote education. Since uh, since high school, I've been uh, promoting education, and uh, before 
in Taliban time or before Taliban, this, the, the education system in, a, in the country was extremely poor. Practically, there were only school through NGO, no government school practically existed in the whole country or in very few in the big cities. So in our village, the school was sponsored by uh, an NGO from UK. Uh, a good friend of mine was, uh, you know, doing that job. And he told me that our budget is limited. We cannot afford to uh, sponsor your school anymore, your village school. What can you do? I said, I'll take go. So I took over that school. I was paying for all the expenses of the school. That means you know, all the teachers, janitor, and uh, even the had an addition of three room building, I paid for that. Since that time, which is 10 years, I would say now, you know, I've been sponsoring that school. Even now, when the government took over school, I'll still pay like one third of the teachers because the government still is not paying all the teachers. We, we sponsor, if there's any other need, for example, there was an NGO, they built a building for us, but there were things I say, well, when you're building this building, you should uh, do the wiring, electricity. Well, there is no electricity in the village, so they say, what do you want electricity? I mean, the wiring. I say, you never know, you might get it, but if you have the electricity under the plaster, now it's easy, then you have to, you know, tear the plaster and make another one. So, they say, we don't have budget for that. So I say, I pay for it. So any expense that need for the improvement of school, I still pay for it. I remember a few years back when I told my wife that I said, if I realize I cannot afford you know, to, to sponsor the school, I will sell my car. I'll sell my car and walk to Purdue. And I cannot let 500 students go home. There is no school. So that's how serious that's I was. Serious. And uh, you know, I've been happy and I'm glad I've done it and I still will continue to do it. Now, I have a dream project. You know, when the, when the when the student come from provinces, normally the government will provide them dormitory, but the dormitories are very limited, practically do not exist anymore. I mean, you know, so little. So what I would like to do is, if I can find the funding to build a dorm, actually two, one for girl, one for boy. So, and uh, charge them only for the maintenance of the building. And um, treat them like sorority or fraternity. So they, they will manage their whole thing within themselves, their whole system, and uh, you know, discipline them. Uh, you know, they will help be counselor, for example, in the building, or, uh, house mother, you know, so to take care of the, sure. all the expenses and discipline and all this kind of thing. That's my dream. Uh, a friend of mine who is a medical doctor, now retired in Switzerland, he had some land. So I spent my own money to, to make four wall around the land because the land over there in Afghanistan, if you have a land, Somebody come and build his house on it. It will be difficult for you to prove it that's your land. So I made four walls and put a gate in, in, the, in both buildings. And there are two lots. One is like uh, three quarters of an acre and the other is like half an acre. So I was thinking to build those dorms there. But the problem is my friends say, you're welcome. You can build on it, and I will help you too. Uh, 
but the problem is that's too far from campus. It should be, let's say, I don't know, maybe 10 miles or so. To come there to a, you know, in a bus to go every day. So now I, I'm not so sure if I want to make that project there. But I spent $25,000 of my own money to, uh, to make that one at least secure it as our property. We have all the document. We have all the document, you know, document from the government of uh, 40 years ago. We have bought, purchased this land. But over there, the, the government structure is so corrupt that if somebody picked this one and says it's mine, <laughs> it will be difficult for proving it it's yours. That's a challenge, yeah. Yeah, it's very yeah. difficult. So In that's my dream is now if I could build that dorms. Because if I would not have had the chance to go to dorm in high school as well as college, I would never have the opportunity to go to school. So each person coming from province, if they don't have the living play facility, it will be difficult for them to go to higher education. Mm -hmm. That's my dream project. Very nice. We'll keep our fingers crossed. Yeah, I hope yeah. to find a, if you know somebody rich guy, a <laughs> couple million know. dollar, a couple million dollar will do it. <laughs> oh, in closing, any closing comments that you'd like to share? Would you say? Yeah. Well, uh, you know, my memory at Purdue is very long time. Uh, and I, when I was student at Purdue University, you know, when, when I went back to Afghanistan, they said, what did you see in the United States? I said, well, the only thing I saw was the library in the Union and classroom. <laughs> and I, think I haven't seen anything else. I was so busy with the library. I remember we had a course in uh, advanced steel structure, and professor will give us an assignment. And uh, and we, as soon as we leave the class, we run, rush to the library to see if we can find references for that material to for the project. And uh, and we would be working hard and stay there. Some of the books were reserved; you cannot take it out. And working day and night. You spend a lot of hours in the library, you know, when I was working for my master's degree. Mm. And the library was a good place, you know, very, you know, a lot of facility and uh, comfortable. And uh, so it was, uh, it was interesting, uh, you know, time when uh, I went to school there uh, as a student. And then, uh, then I become a uh, the chairman of the library committee uh, once, uh, and uh, at that time, all of my stress was to to more more technology, bring more and more technology, bearing more and more technology. That was what I was promoting: more technology to the library. So it looks uh, like you guys have been doing that. So that was uh, my stress to bring more technology. We had a presentation, I think Nancy, you know, came to us, to, uh, we asked her to present, to, you know, what they were doing and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So I was involved uh, in the library, and the uh, library has been doing good. Um, I met your dean, uh, I think, in, a, in commencement, we were sitting in, you know, lunchtime, mm -hmm. so he looks a pleasant person. I hope you guys are still doing a good job. Good. Thank you very much, Professor Baha. I really appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Stephanie, you. thanks. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you for yes. being here.